Good morning, church. Let's all stand as we worship today. Y'all know this song, so let's sing it out. Here we go. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. have a seat. Good morning, church. What a fun way to get started this morning. It is awesome to get to worship our God and to do it with some energy. Amen? It was, I enjoyed that. Enjoy the, the clapping and the pastor Dan's up here stomping his foot and just getting after it. So it's, uh, it's an experience to worship next to him. I'm really sorry because I can't sing a lick, but you had to endure that. Um, I'm excited to be here this morning, and in case you couldn't tell, and I'm ready to worship with you, but we've got some things to get out of the way first. I wanted to let you know about our digital bulletin. If you would, get out your phone, and there's a, a little scrambled image on the, on the pew and behind you, in front of you. It's uh, called a QR code. If you'll just point your camera at it, it'll pop up with a link, and it'll take you to a website where you can have all the, the digital bulletin, you can give online, all the information you would want to know about our church is right there, or you can text the word info. If you're online, you can text the word info to that phone number on the screen and it will get you to the same exact place 
Our goal is to help you to get plugged into what we're doing. Um, this is an awesome church that loves serving the land through the, through the resources that God has given us. And so as we do that, this week we've got something kind of big coming up, and I'm a little bit excited about it. I'm wearing my shirt and everything. We've got Vacation Bible School this week. Uh, thanks to COVID, we, we kind of had to cap it early on in March when we planned this. And so we're only going to have 230 kids here for the week. And so I know that's such a disappointment to only have 230 kids here this week. But they're going to be here, and they're going to hear the gospel, and they're going to have an awesome church experience. And we're going to have an opportunity to try to reach their families. And of those 230 kids, over 60 of them, their parents said, don't go to church anywhere. So the mission field is really coming here this week, and I'm excited about that. And I have a challenge for you. If you are helping this week in Vacation Bible School for one day, for five days, if you help set up, would you just stand up? I'd like to, I'd like to recognize you for just a second. If you would stand up. There are 130 volunteers this week helping with Vacation Bible School. Hold on, stay standing for just a second. I wanna embarrass you just a little bit further. For those of you sitting, would you look around and pick somebody that's standing right now and make a commitment to pray for them this week? They're gonna impact somebody's eternity and I want you to be supporting them if you can. All right, you guys can have a seat. Thank you so much. I'm excited about this week. If you would pray with me. Dear God, I wanna thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and to worship you. God, thank you that you are here in this place place with us. God, I thank you for those that are worshiping online. God, I pray that this morning our worship trans, transfers to their living room, and God, that they can, they can worship you in heart and spirit right alongside of us. God, I pray for the volunteers this week. I pray that you protect them, that you keep them safe, that you keep Satan far, far from them as they are investing in your kingdom, and they are planting seeds that we have no idea when they will sprout. And God, I thank you for the boys and girls that are coming. God, we have no idea how you've been working in their hearts this leading up to this and what you're doing in families before they ever even get here. And God, I just pray for this week that we be obedient to you and we take every opportunity we have to share who you are and to reflect your glory to this community. God, I thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pay on hills and hills and mountains fall, for your participation and for your energy uh, this morning. If you're watching from online, thank you for being here. We're so grateful that we have the opportunity uh, to be together in this way. Today we're going to finish up 2 Peter. Where we're headed next is we are going to uh, talk about, for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about the home, the family, 
uh, the value of gathering together in our homes and the, the benefit and the calling that we have within our homes to make much of Christ and to be kind of our primary discipleship model is really about the home. And so we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be introducing a brand new resource to you that we uh, are going to have available, and you'll see that over the next several weeks. But we're excited about that. I can't think of any better way for us to come out of Vacation Bible School than to talk about families and to talk about moms and dads and grandparents and kids and husbands and wives. It just really is a, a powerful way. And then uh, as we get into the fall and as we get into uh, school starting back, we're going to do a series walking through the book of First John. And so that's kind of where we're headed, and I'm excited about that journey. Today, though, I want, to, I want us to look at the end of Second Peter. Every year, uh, we have what we call our annual meeting as Southern Baptists. And we had that back in June. And honestly, it was a very good annual meeting. I really appreciated that time. We were in Nashville and uh, just a lot of good things happened. But one of the things that happens in our Southern Baptist annual meeting, and really this happens in kind of any formal group, is they have these things that they call resolutions. Now, for, for most of us, when we think about resolutions, we think about just what? New Year's resolutions. That's right. Well, but in a formal body like a, a Congress, a House of Representatives, a Senate, or, or a formal body like the Southern Baptist Convention, there are things called resolutions. And basically what a resolution is, is it is a statement of opinion about a certain topic uh, whereby we get a chance to say, hey, we believe this. It's not binding. It doesn't mean that everybody has to agree. It doesn't mean that, that there is, it doesn't mean it's not a law, it's not a rule. It just simply states an opinion. A few years ago, thankfully a number of years ago, you might remember that the Southern Baptist Convention, some of you don't remember this, and I'm about to let the cat out of the bag. The Southern Baptist Convention boycotted Disney. Do y'all remember that? Some of you remember that. Now, I always thought that was really interesting because the Southern Baptist Convention boycotted Disney, but pastors continued to watch ESPN. And pastors continued to watch Monday Night Football. That's all Disney. Anyway, these resolutions can sometimes get, into, get us into a little bit of trouble. A resolution was what caused us to boycott Disney. I remember, do you know who the president of the convention was when we boycotted Disney? Jim Henry, the pastor of First Baptist Church of Orlando. Ain't that fun? Good times, right? We actually had some resolutions that we passed this past time, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but let me just give you a couple of thoughts about them and why they are so difficult. Resolutions have two parts. They have the whereas statements and they have the be it resolved statements. We passed a resolution this past year in appreciation to the city of Nashville for hosting the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting. Now, rather than us just saying, hey, Nashville, thanks, that would have been a really good resolution, right? Oh, no. We had five whereas clauses just so we could say thanks. There was another resolution that was passed on abolishing abortion. Now, I think as Southern Baptists, as we believe in the Bible, we believe that life begins at conception, and we believe that that's something that we should really uh, think, think strongly about. Do you know that our resolution to abolish abortion had 12 whereas clauses and five be it resolved clauses? Do you know how confusing that kind of stuff is? And you've got a group of 18,000 Southern Baptists all with an opinion trying to vote on these things. And then people get to a mic and they say, I would like to amend whereas statement number six, line four, word three. And everybody's going, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Anyway, all that to say, when you get to the conclusion of who you are, there are some resolutions that you need to make. And what we're going to see today is we're going to see that Peter, through 1 Peter and through 2 Peter, has presented a very strong argument. He has presented a very strong case. 
If you will, through 1 Peter and 2 Peter, he has given us a lot of whereas clauses. Now, I didn't use that word, but he has made his point. He has presented his evidence. And what we're going to look at today, starting in chapter 3, verse 14, is we're going to look at his be it resolved statement. He's going to kind of bring it to a conclusion of how should we live. Follow along now as we look at Peter's be it resolved moment. It's in uh, chapter 3, 2 Peter, uh, verse 14. If you have your Bibles, it will be there on the screen in back of me. Or from the link that you were sent earlier, you can click on sermon notes and follow along there. This is what it says. Therefore, by the way, that's a good concluding word. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, that's referring back to the destruction of everything that is that we talked about last week. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. (laughs) There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, but you, you, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter comes to a point where he begins to, he, he, he resolves He says, okay, I've made my case. I have presented my argument. Now be it resolved. Therefore, he gives a a, a few kind of of qualifications. He he says, since since everything is going to return and since everything is going to be destroyed and since the destruction of all things is at hand, the first thing that he says is that we need to live without spot or blemish. We need to live without spot or blemish. This actually references back to the false teachers that he talked about in 2 Peter chapter 2. Do you remember what he said about them? He said that they are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They are blots and blemishes. And he is saying here in contrast, don't be like them. Don't live like them. Don't believe like them. Don't speak like them. Live in a holy and pure way because we know that Jesus is returning. We know that he is going to come like a thief in the night. We talked about that last week. We know that God is working in the midst. Don't be like those false teachers. Instead, keep your way straight and holy and pure. As we look toward the end, which is coming, We should always be aware that no spot or blemish is found in our lives. Now, is this even possible? Probably not. Are we going to have some areas where we're weaker and stronger? Probably so. However, can I just encourage us to do this? Let's not let our imperfection be an excuse for more imperfection. Instead, let's realize that with the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, because we do have the indwelling Christ, let's make sure that we are not looking at our imperfection and giving it an excuse for even more. Let's recognize that though we may be imperfect, we are always to strive and try to do what God wants us to do. Amen? Yeah live without spot or blemish. Secondly, in light of this, uh, in light of the end, in light of all things, in light of the argument that that Peter has made, we should live at peace. 
I want you to do this for just a second. You ready? I want you to take a deep breath in. And now blow it out. Sometimes, I mean, I think there's no more appropriate time to say this, especially after the tropical storm that we had this past week. Sometimes, in light of Elsa, we just need to let it go. Right? Live at peace. Every argument doesn't need your voice. Every situation shouldn't get under our skin. Sometimes we might need to turn around and just walk away. Because it just is not worth it. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in ourselves and get so tied and tight that we just knot ourselves into knots that we can't untangle ourselves from. Let it go. We need more of those in our life. Because you know, you know what? When the end comes, we know the one who wins. And while this world may be on a trajectory that we may not agree with, we don't really belong here. We have a greater home. We have a greater destination. So let's just recognize that sometimes we just need to and let it go. Recognize that God's got it. Live without spot or blemish. Live at peace. And thirdly, live in the patience of God. Do you remember what he said a few weeks ago? That God is not slow in keeping his promise, but he is patient, wanting all to come to repentance and to faith. You see, sometimes we need to recognize that the patience of God and the fact that he hasn't returned yet means that he is still wanting people to come to know him. And we need to live in that patience for ourselves and for others. We need to recognize that in their time and in his time we have an opportunity and we may have another opportunity to share our faith to challenge them to come to know Christ but as long as the Lord tarries there is time now there's not an unlimited amount of time and we don't need to delay to tomorrow what we could do today but we need to live in the patience of God if he is patient Shouldn't we be patient? I would say absolutely. Since he hasn't come again, we should believe that there's still an expression of his patience toward us and toward others in coming to know him. Then Peter goes kind of crazy. He has this little insert in the end here, and you might have noticed it. There's an interesting little section about Paul. Did you see that? All of a sudden, he starts talking about Paul, and, and he says that, that, there's, that, that, you know, he should believe, that people should believe these things just as Paul wrote. Now, the interesting behind-the-scenes thing there is that Peter and Paul, two of the church leaders of the day, Peter being the kind of the leader of the church at Jerusalem, Peter was the one that preached the sermon on the day of Pentecost that 3,000 people came to join the church. I mean, he was a big dude. He was a, he was a powerful guy. Peter was somebody that people really paid attention to. And then Paul, through his letter writing, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He started churches. He was the first, if you will, Christian missionary. They didn't like each other. They disagreed. Specifically, they disagreed about whether or not people that were not Jews could come to know Christ. And if they did, how they came to know Christ. Peter believed that the, uh, that the, that the uh, Jewish message from the Jewish Messiah of the Jewish salvation was for Jews. Paul believed that, no, 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 we are supposed to expand that. There was a, a disagreement between Peter and Paul. And I think it's beautiful 
It's a beautiful picture of the uh, unity of the body of Christ that in this section, while it seems a little odd, that Peter basically says to all of his readers, hey, listen to me, listen to what Paul has to say too. And I think it's also interesting, just as kind of an aside, where he says, hey, uh, listen to what Paul has to say. He has taught you some great things. And he even says, even those things that are hard to understand. Now, I just love this. This is one of Jesus' disciples. This is one of the guys that walked with Jesus for three years. And he says to his readers, sometimes the stuff that Paul writes is hard to understand. Have any of you ever read anything that Paul wrote and said, wow, that was really difficult to understand? We're in good company, aren't we? That, that, that actually makes me kind of feel good about my life and about my own faith and about my understanding of God's Word. It doesn't mean that everything is always going to make easy sense. Here is Peter, one of the greats, saying, sometimes some of the stuff he writes is difficult to understand. But he also says that we should not let those difficult parts that are, those parts that are difficult to understand confuse us to the point of leading us away from faith. Instead, we should allow the clear, this is an, this is an important uh, principle for all of biblical life, we should let the clear portions of Scripture interpret the difficult portions of Scripture. While we might find some places that I don't really understand that, many times we can allow other parts that do make sense to us, that are very clear, be put into those parts that are a little bit more difficult to understand, and we can interpret the difficult parts of Scripture with the clear parts of Scripture. Does that make sense? It's a really simple process, and it's something that we should do in our lives. Don't let those difficult to understand sayings sway us from faith in Christ. All right. Now, he gets really down to the nitty-gritty of his be it resolved statements. Three quick things. He says, first of all, in light of all of this, maintain stability in an unstable world. Some of you have noticed this as well as I have. Our culture is falling apart. Our world is confusing itself. Things that we said this is going to be the best have now begun to go full circle, and people are now questioning things that they said, oh, this is going to be it. I remember... Uh, a few years ago, on the weekend after the Obergefell decision passed the Supreme Court, some of you don't even know what that is, the Obergefell decision was what made uh, uh, homosexual marriage legal in all 50 states. And it basically put it into the hands of the states. I remember Russell Moore, the director of our Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, standing in front of the Supreme Court addressing churches with shouts of joy in the background, this is what he said. He said, church, in light of the decision that has been made, while we can disagree on biblical grounds, in light of the decision that has been made here, realize that you are going to have an opportunity to minister to people. They're going to walk down a road that they think will make them happy. But because it is not according to God's design, it will only end in confusion and disappointment. And when they get confused and when they get disappointment, disappointed and when they hurt, guess who they'll come to? Keep your arms open. Continue to love. Continue to show grace. And realize that one day you will have an opportunity to speak in those lives. Interesting, isn't it? You know, sometimes we can be so hard against certain situations. Friend, we need to be the stability that the world needs. Because of our faith in Christ, we need to stand strong. And when the waves of the world begin to toss the culture back and forth, we can say, I've got an anchor. I am standing stable. I'm not tossed by all of that. 
Come here. Let me show you the truth. Let me show you the way. Let me show you the life. You can only come to the Father through Jesus Christ. We, as the body of Christ, must be the stability that the world needs. It's why the church is so important. It's why our belief in God is so important. We must stand strong. Maintain stability in an unstable world. Secondly, this kind of goes along with that. We need to grow in grace. Grow in grace. We need to grow (laughs) two different ways. We need to grow in the grace that is administered to us. We need to recognize as Christians that when we fail, the grace of God covers our failures. The grace of God offers to us forgiveness, not because we deserve it, but because Jesus died for us. Not because we've earned any kind of positive treatment from the Lord, but because Jesus covered our sins with his blood and therefore we can stand strong and grow in the grace that God has given to us. And then secondly, we need to grow in the grace that is administered to others. There is, friend, there is one judge and one Lord of all, and we need to not try to sit on his seat. We need to recognize that we need to give grace to others because guess what? They're failures and flunkies just like we are. They just might fail and flunk a little bit bigger. But they need to know that there are a group of people that while we may disagree, we are not the judge, jury, and executioner. We are giving grace where God has given grace. We are loving where God has loved. We are encouraging where God has encouraged. We're standing. Now remember, together, be the stability. Live the truth. Grow in grace. This is tough, isn't it? And then thirdly, grow in knowledge. Grow in knowledge. Grow in knowledge of God's word. Grow in knowledge of doctrine, of of Christian doctrine. Grow in knowledge of of the church and of Christian history. Grow in knowledge of the church fathers. Grow in knowledge of movements of Christianity. Grow in knowledge of the truth. One of the greatest ways that you can grow in your knowledge is to read your Bible. How simple is that? But how powerful. Grow. Grow. In knowledge. We need to be reading, thinking, learning, listening, watching, understanding as much as we can. We need to apply our minds to the truth. We need to apply our minds and our biblical worldview to the culture that we live in. We need to recognize that this world is not our home, but we are called to live in it for a while. And we must be effective in the way that we challenge the truth of this world. Because the truth of this world is what? It's not truth. The truth of this world is just simply going along to get along. We need to challenge that truth effectively. Maintain stability in an unstable world. Grow in grace. Grow in knowledge. Be it resolved. As we come to the end, let's be resolved. So I want to ask you a quick question, and then we're going to have a time of invitation. By the way, we have not done this for quite a while, but we are going to have a time of invitation today. We're going to have a time where this altar will be open. If you would like to come and kneel at these steps and make it an altar, we will have an opportunity for you to do that. I'll be down front to pray with you and encourage you. By the way, just so you know, I brought a mask in my pocket. If you don't feel comfortable being face-to-face with somebody that is unmasked, you wear your mask down the aisle. As you come, I'll put mine on because I want you to not feel like that's that's a difficulty. If you're watching from home, 
I want to encourage you even during these next few moments to maybe pick a spot in your home that you can use as a place of kneeling, a place of commitment. Maybe, maybe it's a certain couch in the room. Maybe it's a certain table. Maybe it's, in a, maybe it's in another room. But let's take just a few moments and let's take these moments to, to really dedicate ourselves and commit ourselves to his purpose in our lives. I want to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to stand. And as Carlos leads us to sing, we're going to respond to God's call on our life. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your provision in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity that we have in these next few moments to respond to you. God, speak to us in a powerful way as we continue to worship together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? And as Carlos sings, would you respond to his call on your life? You can come and pray. I'm here to pray with you. Whatever God's calling you to do, this is your time. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, oh sinner, come home. And why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? And why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for? good to be able to respond. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for those that just continued to pray. Thank you for those that just allowed, even in your seat, for the Lord to just continue to work. Thank you for those that are at home uh, that just allowed this to be a time of commitment and a time of responding to God's call on our life. I'm thankful that you are here. I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll close our time together. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for this time of, of uh, sharing together. Thank you for your word. And God, I just pray that you will continue to work in our lives. Thank you for this day of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining us today at Stetson Baptist Church Online. We were so grateful that you had an opportunity to join with us in this way. I know that for many of you that are watching, maybe you're out of town, maybe you're on the road, or maybe you're in your home. And for a lot of you, you would love to be here in person. 
I, I, would, I want you to know that we would love for you to come. We'd love for you to be a part of what God's doing as we gather together. But in the meantime, we are so thankful that we have this way that we can gather together in a virtual streaming way. I'm grateful that you were a part of today's service. A couple of quick things before we leave. First of all, we would love for you to check into this service if you haven't done so already by texting the word CHECK to 386 400 9991. Also, we would love to uh, let you know about the things that are coming up and the things that are ongoing in our church by texting the word INFO to 386-400-9991. The on there is also a digital connect card in our digital bulletin. And then finally, if you text the word GIVE to 386-400-9991, we would love for you to have access so that you can give online. Other ways that you can give to our church is uh, you can use your bank's bill pay system or you can drop a, uh, a, a, an offering by the church office any day this week. We are so thankful that you were here today. I pray that you will take the words that we have shared and the message that we've shared and that the impact of that message will be life-changing for you and it will be something that you'll be able to apply to your life every day this week. Also, please know in this time as we are continuing to work through this process, we love you, we care about you. And if there's any way that our church can serve you and your family, we would love to. Just give us a call. 386-734-1991. That's a different phone number. Or you can uh, actually email us at, it goes to all of our pastors, info at stetson.church. That's distributed to all of our pastors. So we would love to get in touch with you in that way. Know that we care about you. Know that we love you. It's the summertime. We've got a lot of things going on. We just are so appreciative of your prayers. And we're very much looking toward the fall where ministry is going to kick off full steam. We look forward to what God is doing in your life. And we can't wait to see you again. God bless you. Thanks for being a part of this service. We hope to see you again next week.